Jamie Awalt from Tennessee, who is our moderator for today. Jamie? Thank you, Lisa. Um, I don't see the controls yet. If someone wants to hand those over to me. In the meantime, hello, everyone. My name is Jamie Awalt. I'm the Director of Preservation and Digitization here at the Tennessee State Library and Archives. On behalf of the COSA Education and uh, Programming Committee, welcome to our April COSA member webinar. We're going to talk about advocacy for archives. Um, and my controls just disappeared. I'm sorry, Lisa. There we go. Nothing like technical difficulties right off the bat. Uh, today's speakers will be Jody Foley from Montana State um, Archives, Dave Cheever from Maine, Jim Corden, retired from Indiana State Archives. Uh, Jim and David are the COSA Advocacy Committee co-chairs. So to tell you a little bit more about our speakers, first off will be Jody Foley, the Montana State Archivist. Jody is a proud Montana native and University of Montana alumna. She has worked at the Montana Historical Society since 1990, serving as state archivist since 2005. She is the past president of Northwest Archivists and Northwest Oral Historians. And Jody has served as the past chair for both the Closest to Home Project and the Advocacy Committee. And she's the current vice president, president-elect of COSA. So welcome, Jody. Dave Cheever is currently serving his second six-year term as Maine's state archivist and is the vice chairman of Maine's Bicentennial Commission. Prior to his nomination in 2007, Dave had extensive nonprofit media, education, and government experience. Dave's cultural work includes eight years as a member of the Board of Fort Western, eight years on the Board of Maine Preservation, eight years with the former Maine Arts Sponsors Association, and as a founding member and president of the Maine Community Cultural Alliance. So thank you, Dave, for being here. And then finally, we have Jim Corden. He's the former state archivist of Indiana. Jim was a founder of the, and the first chair of CERI, the State Electronic Records Initiative. Jim also serves as the co-chair of the COSA Advocacy Committee, and he's the chair of the Joint Working Group for Awareness and Advocacy. He's a past president of COSA. So welcome, Jim, and thank you for being here. So a little bit about the agenda quickly. First, we will hear from Jody. She's going to give us news from the mid-year board meeting. Then Dave will talk to us about Advocacy Committee and their overview of their work. And then finally, Jim will talk about archival collaborations and the federal budget update. We will have plenty of time for questions and comments and answers, so please, you can put those in the chat uh, box. We will be monitoring that or, um, you know, just let us know if you have any questions or comments. And then finally, Lisa is going to come back and she's going to talk about upcoming webinars and events. So I think if everyone's ready, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Jody? Can someone Hi there, talk everyone. <laughs> Hi, Jody. Hi there. Hi there. Um, thank you, Jamie, for the great introduction. Um, I'm going to be talking about the mid-year board meeting and partner briefing. Uh, the COSA Board of Directors convened in Washington, D.C. on March 24th and 5th for their annual mid-year mid -year board meeting. The first day we conducted general board business and prepped for our meetings with NARA and our partners. I'm going to focus on that latter part uh, for the rest of my time. The board met with the Archivist of the United States, uh, David Ferriero, Congressional Affairs Director, John Hamilton, External Affairs Liaison Meg Phillips, NHPRC Executive Director Christopher Eck, and uh, NHPRC Director of State Programs uh, Dan Stokes. Um, and the focus really of the meeting was collaboration. One of the major goals of the Advocacy Committee in the past year has been to build COSA's relationship with NARA through expanded communication and collaboration. One result of this is the popular COSA and NARA webinars. Um, to date, they've included uh, collaborative access projects with NARA speaking on the History Hub and Alabama talking about crowdsourcing transcriptions of World War I records and innovative approaches to record scheduling with NARA talking about their big bucket approach 
and North Carolina talking about their functional analysis approach to schedules. We have a couple more this year set. Um, one is um, dealing with the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which is coming up in 2020, and working on still photographs. And I'm pleased to say that these webinars will continue. NARA and COSA leadership will be asking uh, for areas of interest from their members and, and potential speakers in the months to come. Some future topics may include uh, social media, open government, and outreach. So uh, be thinking about those things, what topics you might be interested in learning about how NARA is handling things and how other states are handling them on, on those topics. Other continued areas of communication and collaboration will include uh, building on the Great Ideas Exchange Day. Uh, this, the first of these was held uh, last year in D.C. at the Joint Conference. Um, we're still discussing at this point what, uh, what this will look like into the future, but we do want to continue with something along those lines. The ideas right now is uh, looking to focus the exchange to maybe a single or a series of related topics, more like a symposium. So watch this space, and we'll have more information as that develops. We'll also be looking at including Meg in our Meg Phillips, that is, in our quarterly board meetings to allow idea exchanges about what's happening at NARA and what's happening with the states uh, so that we can, in, change, in turn, share those with you, our members. We also have some ongoing discussions about um, the general importance of government records and our shared concerns for reliable records, accountability, digital liter literacy, and civic engagement, um, the impacts and implications of government shutdowns on record access, and uh, the places our organizations can work together potentially or at least share information on what we're doing regarding the, 20, uh, the 250th anniversary of the U.S. Um, I, it's my understanding at this point that many states have commissions that are already working on these projects, and of course the Archivist of the United States is on a national council that is um, planning um, at the national level what events will occur. We also met with Leslie Reynolds, Executive Director of the National Association of Secretaries of State, or NAS, um, discussing information needs that COSA could fill. Um, this is part of the access grant, which you'll hear more about, but it was a great conversation. I think we're going to have uh, lots of information and repurposing of some of the uh, products that have come out of um, the access grant. So you'll hear a little bit more about that in a moment. And we also had the annual um, partner briefing. The partner briefing provides the unique opportunity for COSA to present their goals and accomplishments over the past year to major stakeholders, funders, supporters, and allied professionals. Uh, there was nearly 25 organizations there, including uh, grant partners, such as the National Governors Association, NACIO, um, which is the National Association of CIOs, and NAS, Secretary of State. Allied professional organizations like the uh, National Coalition for History, ALA, IIMC, which is Municipal Clerks, the American Alliance of Museums, National Humanities Alliance, uh, American Institute for Conservation. There are also vendors there, um, Apex, Preservica, Family Search included, and of course, uh, fellow archival organizations, uh, SAA and NAGARA. This is a great opportunity to share um, areas of concern and potential collaboration, advocacy, the challenges of, the, of preservation and access as far as digital collections are concerned, promotion of humanities collections in general, and of course, funding. Our presentations included repo reports from each committee detailing their current and ongoing projects. Much of what you're going to hear during the rest of the webinar um, details those. So I'm not going to provide a lot of detail, but I, I wanted to at least present them. The Syrian Access Grant um, report was on the history of the projects, the goal and accomplishment um, to date to improve electronic records management and digital preservation. And on the Access Grant side, uh, forming strategic partnerships and gathering and creating best practices and standards. The Education Committee reported on their three webinar series that they uh, are working on, including the one you're listening to right now, listservs, social media, and e-news. Uh, the Advocacy Committee reported on monitoring the budget process on the federal budget level and its potential impact on 
federally funded entities that support or serve our profession, NARA, NHPRC, IMLS, NEH, to name a few. And also on the NHPRC and NARA side, continuing to support and advocate for NHPRC reauthorization, working with a joint working group on issues and awareness, which is COSA, SAA, NAGARA, and RAC, um, and including preparing participants for visits to congressional district offices as follow-ups to uh, last year's Archives on the Hill. And also um, issues and brief statements that we put forward, position statements on autonomous government archives and broadband access statements. One last piece of the uh, meeting that we had was a brief preview of the state of uh, state records, which is a biennial survey, survey that we all do. Um, I can't give you any teasers at this point, but do know that um, the preview that the report itself will be coming out soon. Um, for those who attended, can, you can attest that the presentation and um, so forth was, is very helpful, but the best part is the questions and so forth afterwards. We have those great conversations and realize that these are people who support us and um, we can always do more in, in terms of uh, collaboration and advocacy. So I'm going to pass this off at this point to David Cheever. As you've already been told, he's the co-chair of your advocacy committee. Thank you very much, Jody. And um, I, I'm, I'm always a little uh, humbled when I get in, in this crowd because uh, I look around at the advocacy committee and we have Jody, obviously, who's coming in as, as president next year. And, and John Dugan, as president, serves uh, on, on every committee, and he was kind enough to ask me to be co-chair with uh, with Jim with this one. But you look down through, and and for those of you who can now see it, you got Tim Baker from Maryland, uh, Jelaine Chubb from Texas, uh, Sarah Coons from North Carolina, Steve Murray from Alabama, uh, Kathleen Rose retired from New York, uh, obviously Barbara, and John and Jody, uh, and and Jim. Uh, these are all uh, top officials in COSA. And in Nagara, they have been uh, in the in the trenches for uh, this organization and others, and have held lead positions. And to have them as a stable of people on the advocacy committee is a real treat. Uh, the institutional memory, uh, the kinds of things uh, for which they are uh, prepared and about which they are sensitive, uh, and then the savoir faire that comes with it. Uh, in knowing what to do, when to do, and how to do it. Uh, it makes it a treat uh, for me, because I'm sort of the newbie on this along with Karen. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a good committee, and, uh, and I credit all of those who serve on it and, and allow me to kind of hang out with them for a while. Um, part of what we do, and I think I've, there I need to do that. Um, we have a pretty good idea of what it is we're, we're looking to do in that we all believe, as the slide obviously says, we play a critical role in preserving the nation's history and the rights of its citizens. And we're really, almost even more so than the National Archives, we're where the rubber meets the road in our respective states. We're where people go when they're looking for their vital records, when they're looking for the, the court records, when they're looking for the things that are the evidentiary documents of our existence as states and for the people uh, who reside in that state or who have resided and now are looking for help in, in showing the, the rest of the world that that's in fact what happened. The archival programs that we run provide appropriate and critically unbiased and effective stewardship of the historical records that are under all of our care. And it doesn't matter whether you know we're only archives centric or whether in, in our case and a number of the other cases of uh, state archives, that have records management responsibilities also on their shoulders. This is an important piece, that, that we are unbiased and that we are effective in our stewardship, which is the provision of public access to the records and the pre preservation of their care. It's a complete deal. And as long as we're meeting our responsibilities and doing so in an effective manner, um, it's not that we're going to be, you know, a wash in money and funding and, and accolades from all over, but we'll have the quiet confidence of knowing that we're doing our job the right way. Uh, the consistent funding and support for the work of state archives enables us, to the degree that we can, manage effectively and make the archival records 
widely accessible, and I'll get to that in a minute, and we take advantage of the evolving technologies, and we foster the kind of innovative projects and research that help make this, this discipline a very dynamic piece. And for those who, who walk into an archives, regardless at what level, and say, oh, yeah, there's nothing going on here, uh, this is a glorified warehouse, nothing could be further from the truth. And particularly with the evolving technologies and what we can now do to make uh, the records that are under our care more readily accessible to the public we serve is part of the fascination and part of the challenge we have going forward. Yeah, let's see, did I skip over one? Um, the goals that we've identified in our agenda uh, will be uh, obviously self evident. Uh, we are a clearinghouse for information on current and emerging issues. We keep our finger to the pulse. Um, we rely upon our membership to tell us if there's an emerging issue. We also, when we get together, as we do um, uh, at least once a year, and oftentimes with these committees um, once a month or better, uh, we are able to uh, pay attention to the things that are happening in the field. And we have the, the benefit of the wisdom and the professionalism of our peer group to say, hey, have you thought about this? And this is something that's happening with us. And particularly with the Advocacy Committee, I've noticed that, that and certainly the respect among our peers is such uh, that we have open exchanges. And uh, I really think that we've been uh, an effective committee for COSA, but more importantly, an effective committee for the field. We do participate in policy and funding discussions to reinforce the mission of state archives, and we've expanded that to include also to participate in policy and funding discussions to reinforce the mission of the National Archives to the degree that we can weigh in and on occasion when the need is there at the federal level. Uh, there's no reason for us not to uh, advocate on behalf of NHPRC and advocate on behalf of NARA to look at the issues that, that are plaguing uh, the National Archives because of the same issues that plague us, which I'll get to in just a minute as well. We develop advocacy and awareness mes messages to strengthen the state archives. Uh, you'd think, well, I, you know, don't we all do that? And the answer is not, not always by ourselves. Sometimes the, the ability to be able to tap into our peer group, to be able to to bring forth a message that we can share. And there have been a couple of examples where states have mistreated their archives or mistreated their archivist, left a position vacant for too long a period of time, or not looked at the qualities and qualifications that you want in an archivist. And we've been able to step in and, and chide, if you will, but advise even better, and to provide guidance where it is appropriate to help everybody try to stay on the path that will ensure that we are doing our jobs effectively in every state and in every territory. We also work in partnership with the counterparts and allied organizations, Jody's mentioned them, to develop the broad coalition that support uh, the Council of State Archivists mission and the individual state archives mission. They're not terribly far removed from one another. Most recently, in fact, within the last six weeks, we were aware of an issue that arose in the state of Texas uh, we were educated on that issue and arising from the work of the advocacy committee and knowledgeable that other organizations were also taking a look and uh, not alarmed so much, but very serious care. And we believe that the best thing for us to do would be to send a message to the legislators of Texas that what they were doing needed to be fully thought out and they needed to understand the ramifications of that which was being proposed by what we believed would be a, a minority of people who tucked an amendment into a reauthorization bill, and that amendment was going to cause a considerable amount of work, if not damage, uh, to the archives and, and library of the state of Texas, but also potentially to the records that belong in that archive. So we looked at that. Um, Partly in response to uh, a perceived need, and this is a two-part piece on the universal broadband, um, with the understanding that we have evolving technologies that are, are pushing us forward into this 21st century that, and, and going faster and faster, and we are having to accommodate and, and acclimate to these technologies. One of the things that become, becomes apparent is that it's one thing for us to put those records out there 
so that they are retrievable in a digital form, for example, and and they are the patrons to receive those can be residing anywhere in the world. But if we are unable to deliver those uh, records, digital records, because of the inability of the delivery system, then we need to do what we can to ensure that that all of the patrons, regardless of where they are, can have access to the records that matter most to them. And in our case, we were a little late coming to the party, but again, one of the committee members brought this forward as an idea. Steve Murray had been to a conference in Boise with uh, ASLH, and I said, so, well, you know, what are they talking about? He said, well, they're, they're talking about universal broadband. And I said, have we put out a statement on that? And he said, no, but we should. And we began drafting, crafting, you know, co-opting somebody else's language, a little piece here, a little piece there. And the next thing you know, we had a coherent statement that put COSA on record in joining so many of our associated groups to say that, yes, universal broadband matters. And it's going to matter even more so that when we look at the, the other challenge, the other half of this, which is to ensure that all of our members at the state archives level have the capacity to do uh, the digital uh, recording, the digitization, and the sharing of those digital records and documents uh, through the transmission system that the technology now allows. If we are not up to speed on, on standards, if we're not up to speed, literally up to speed uh, with the transmission uh, technologies, then we are not fulfilling our responsibility. And we're not all there. Our, our State-to-state -state surveys have been indicating all along, whether it's been Siri or whether we've been uh, just on the on the biennial surveys. We know how far we have to, and we have come already, but we also know how far we have to go. And if there's a way for us to bring that forward as part of our advocacy message to say that this is something that we need to do and it needs to go hand in hand with the provision of universal broadband, then I think that we are we are helping the field quite a bit. Um, in the uh, the odd chance that occurred last October in Archives Month, uh, the National Archivist put out on his blog um, a statement um, where he was feeling uh, some of the, the the vestiges of the the whole Kavanaugh inc incident of the, uh, uh, the consideration of the uh, the records and and the qualifications of. Uh, a Supreme Court uh, judicial nominee, and he shared with us uh, at our meeting in Washington um, some of some of the vexations he had had, the pressures that had been brought to bear on the National Archives to produce Kavanaugh's materials uh, for both parties and for all parties, if, uh, including the media, if you want to count that, and that there was only so much that they could do at and in so quick a period of time, and that he wasn't there nor is the National Archives to be there, to be a biased arbiter, to put a thumb on the scale, to hurry this or slow that, that they were going as fast as they could, regardless of who was asking. And that, in fact, one of the hallmarks of the National Archives, as it should be for all of us in the archival field, is that we are not partisan in our undertakings. We are not partisan in the commission of our responsibilities, that we are, in fact, autonomous, and, and we talked about whether autonomous was synonymous with independent, but it is autonomous. We want to be free of the kind of, of uh, political pressures that can then place the neutrality of our actions into question. We are here to serve everyone, and we, we will favor no one because everyone should be equal in the eyes of the archives. Um, and the, the uh, site that you see at the bottom, uh, we have our position statements on these and others uh, on file. You can look them up um, and would encourage you to do so. It's sort of what we do. And with that, I will turn it over to my good friend, Jim Corden. Thanks, Dave. Um, thank you all for joining us today. And I want to bring up speed on some specific things that are happening across the country. Uh, that are affecting the State Archives community <clears throat> from a political um, Washington, D.C. kind of aspect. But let me begin by talking about some of the collaborative efforts we're taking on. Um, 
so as mentioned by Jody, I think the joint working group on issues and awareness, <clears throat> which includes the Council of State Archivists, NAGARA, SAA, and RAC, um, have been working collaboratively for some time now, maybe three years, four years, where we're trying to coordinate our advocacy efforts, um, joint advocacy projects, um, and I'll talk about that in a second because we have one coming up that we'd like you to participate in, and issuing joint statements um, uh, as drafts to the various boards for them to review and approve so that the archives community as a whole can um, be unified in its positions on lots of issues where we can find uh, unanimous consent amongst us to push for certain things to happen. So it's been a very interesting challenge initially, and that group is working fairly well. Um, and you'll, you should be happy it was largely uh, instigated by efforts from COSA to start that thing. Um, but we have Dennis Riley, who actually was on this call, I think, um, who was one of SA's representatives, and he used to be the chair of the Committee on Public Policy, COP, which you see listed here. It's one of, SA has two different committees, one on awareness and one on public policy that are on that committee. And they continue to be key allies of ours in doing work. And just in the last year, Nagara has created its own advocacy committee, so they're much more involved. And RAC has had an advocacy committee for a couple of years now. <clears throat> so. Those are all positives. Uh, Jody talked about the access grant partners, um, NGA, NASIO, NAS, and COSLA. And so it's great to be working with those groups who can help strengthen our message and foster stronger communication amongst all of our groups. So we have a link into the National Governors Association, for instance, where when there's issues that arise or transitions occur from one governor to the next, we, have, we can work with them in advance and provide documentation so that they know exactly what needs to be done um, in preserving and uh, transferring records over to the archives. Now, whether that happens is a different issue, but at least they know what the rules are. Uh, and then lastly, we work quite a bit with the National Coalition for History, <clears throat> which is an organization um, linked closely with the American Historical or History Association the AHA, and they are um, based in Washington, D.C., and have a lobbyist who works with them that we occasionally consult with and uh, try to coordinate our efforts through. And, Jamie, if you could advance the next slide. Um, the 2020 budget news and legislation. Here is the hottest news from D.C. related to our field at the moment. Uh, <clears throat> The National Archives budget, and I think it was under Tim Baker when he was president um, two years ago, COSA uh, really began to shift its advocacy efforts to not only push for NHPRC issues, which has been going on for years, but also to try to assist the National Archives with their um, advocacy needs uh, because if the National Archives isn't doing well, it's going to impact the rest of the state archives. And if the National Archives is doing well, our hope is that it will also impact us in a positive way. So we want to make sure that the National Archives is a role model, strong, et cetera. <clears throat> so um, the bad news is for the last at least five years, I'd say, the National Archives has been taking small cuts, 5%, 3%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%. And as we all probably know, having gone through the recession in the past, um, when that happens, your program starts to get wacky, and that's happening currently with the National Archives. Uh, in this year's budget from the president, the National Archives, the big National Archives has been cut 5% again. And um, so they're looking at reducing hours and services and um, making changes at the presidential libraries in this current system, the current year, to accommodate that budget. Um, their budget is currently proposed at under 400 million. Uh, I think two or three years ago, they're at 425-ish million. So COSA's position and the Joint Advocacy Committee, so really the archives as a whole position is to be advocating for a $425 million National Archives budget um, in the hopes that the hours that's in, in Washington, D.C. for access to the archives get put back in place that they can hire more staff, um, that the services aren't diminished, that the presidential libraries don't reduce their security staffs and so forth. So 
there's a lot going on there. I could, I could spend probably another half an hour talking about the challenges the National Archives is facing. Um, they did receive a $20 million kind of capital um, transfer this year where they're going to be working on a massive digitization effort, digitization equipment, but there's not any long-time uh, staffing operating dollars that go with that. So another challenge for them that we're going to be trying to help them with. The second issue bullet pointed here, and if you have questions, please feel free to add them into the chat, and I'm sure that uh, Jamie will bring us up to speed on them uh, as we conclude here. The second question or issue is NHPRC's budget. Um, President Trump, like President Obama and President Bush before him, zeroed out NHPRC's budget, um, which then requires us and others to come to the um, cry and call for NHPRC and fight for budget funding. Uh, I think three years ago, NHPRC's budget actual appropriation was $5 million. It then moved up two years ago to $6 million. So it was the first time we've seen an increase in years. Uh, and then the exciting news for all of you, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, is that this year we think we have a decent shot at fighting for a 15, I'm sorry, a $10 million NHPRC budget not just budget, but appropriation. Um, so there may actually be $4 million of additional funding available for grants and NHPRC projects. Uh, will, oh, and I'll cover that in a little bit more detail in a minute, but there's, there's light at the end of that tunnel. The next issue is NHPRC reauthorization. NHPRC, in order to be a federal program, you're supposed to be authorized. NHPRC's reauthorization or authorization lapsed in 2009, which is part of the reason we're constantly having to go before, go up to Washington, D.C. or write letters on behalf of NHPRC to push for this to be funded and funded and funded and funded year after year. And so we're working to get it actually reauthorized so that it reduces the effort we have to put in every year to try and fight for the same level of dollars. Um, it looks like NHPRC reauthorization may well happen in 2019, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, it had been authorized, which was the level that the Appropriations Committee, in theory, should go up to, could go up to, at $10 million um, 10 years ago when it was last authorized. And it had been at that $10 million figure for maybe two or three decades now. So we have some allies in Congress, actual congressional members, who are looking at increasing NHPRC reauthorization to 15 million. So in a second, I'll get into more detail about that. Then we have IMLS and NEH's budgets. Both of those have been zeroed out. Um, IMLS's friends like the American Library Association, the Muse Museum Association, et cetera, and COSA are all working, and SAA and Nagara and RAC are all working to try and make sure that IMLS budget is uh, brought back up. The access grant that we've talked about today is an IMLS funded grant. So COSA and state archives are getting IMLS grants on occasion. Um, so it's beneficial for us as an organization to, to continue to advocate for IMLS. In addition, NEH was zeroed out, the National Endowment for Humanities. Um, we are asking for 167.5 billion, million, sorry, not billion, but million dollars to be put back in their budget. Um, it's not necessarily always a COSA issue for NEH budget, but it does affect other archival institutions, particularly academics, who can get NEH funding much more easily than COSA or state archives can. And I don't think I mentioned the IMLS uh, numbers, 270.6 million is the number we're looking to seek. Um, so we went, Sarah Koontz and I, um, spent a day on Capitol Hill, and then the second day, Barbara Teague joined us after the COSA board meeting was over that Jody mentioned. And so in, in those two days of meetings, um, we shared with key committee staffers. So the way Washington set up, if you visit an individual congressperson, they have their own staff for their home districts, and the same for senators. There's also a whole other set of staff that actually staff the committee's like the Appropriations Committee, the Oversight Committee, the Defense Committees, et cetera, Armed Services Committee. And so those people are like the longtime experts who develop in Washington that help write the laws and have a significant influence. So we spent much of our time meeting with those staff people for the committees 
uh, explaining to them what was going on in the archives community, the needs we have, the opportunities that exist out there. And so our message to those people was the National Archives is not in good shape. It needs to no longer take cuts. NHPRC needs to be reauthorized. NHPRC needs funding. Um, and we kind of laid out the case for why archives are important. I will share with you that for the first time in probably, I'll say, six or seven years of doing visits on it in the Capitol, um, we probably have the most, well, we didn't probably, we did have the most positive reactions from both sides uh, to our meetings. Um, lots of support. Uh, so we're hopeful that with all of us, including those people on the call right now, helping us to push forward an agenda, um, we may actually make some progress here for the archival community in getting additional funding and getting NHPRC reauthorized. Uh, we did meet with the Oversight Committee in the House of Representatives, <clears throat> and I'm going to share with you the challenges we will face in the next six months in the, in the 2019 legislative year for Washington. Um, the Oversight Committee is, that is over the, the National Archives and NHPRC is the same Oversight Committee that does all the major investigations. So Elijah Cummings from Maryland. Um, who is very supportive, his, and his staff is extraordinarily supportive of the National Archives and NHPRC. <clears throat> uh, he chairs the big committee, and that's the one that President Trump is saying, none of my people are going to go before your committee. We're refusing to uh, follow through on your subpoenas, et cetera. So there's going to be a big fight, and I suspect that the Republicans and Democrats will start bickering there. And that, unfortunately, is the committee that all of our NHPRC reauthorization has to go through. And we're trying to make this a bipartisan bill, the reauthorization. So we have some struggles there, and I'll mention that in a second. Secondly, the Appropriations Committee, um, we're hopeful that we can get $10 million for NHPRC into the budget or into the appropriations process, and we've gotten some positive signals. Our challenge there will likely be, is there going to be an actual budget this year, or do we go back to a continuing resolution which has funded the government now for, I don't know, three, four, five years. Um, if we're at a continuing resolution, it'll be much more difficult, if not impossible, to get that money up because they'll probably revert back to $6 million. So there's some things that are completely out of our control um, that may occur here because of, dare I say, dysfunction in Washington. <clears throat> so follow-up issues to these advocacy visits. The reauthorization language is being drafted um, so in each of these committees, there's subcommittees, and the subcommittee that has direct authority for oversight um, in the House is chaired by a gentleman named Jerry Connolly uh, from Virginia, and the ranking member, which would be the Republican leader on that committee, is um, Mark Meadows from North Carolina. Those two gentlemen are currently working to draft legislation to reauthorize NHPRC, and we believe at 15 million. And currently, NHPRC has a seat for NAGARA and a seat for SAA and other organizations. Um, we've included or asked that be included in the language, and the National Archives has agreed to include a seat for COSA, since COSA is the only national organization that is not represented on that commission in the archives field. So we expect that to probably occur. Um, what I would ask you and your friends and your friends on the SHRAB and your friends group in your, for the archives is that as we proceed here, um, that you consider doing congressional visits. And that will be the next slide, which I'm not quite to yet, but we'll talk about that in a second. The other thing is I mentioned, you know, the follow-up is the NHPRC side for funding. And that's going to be really critical. Uh, so what I would then say is um, what we're asking all of you to do and all your friends and everybody else is think about getting congressional district visits um, in the next couple of weeks or the next 30 days or so. And the reason the timing is so important here, and this is something that the Joint Working Group on Issues and Awareness uh, which includes, as we've said, COSA, RAC, NAGARA, and SAA. Um, the reason this is such a critical issue 
is because in the next 30 days, the budget, the actual appropriations process is happening behind the scenes. And so the appropriators um, are out there deciding how much money is going to go to everything. And so it's important for congressional districts and U.S. senators' offices to hear that there's interest in making sure that NHPRC is uh, receiving a $10 million appropriation and certainly not zero. Um, otherwise, we might find ourselves with no money for SHRABs and grant projects, and that could be really detrimental to all of us. Um, I would suggest that if you have a chance, if you haven't already seen this or weren't able to participate on the webinar last week uh, on COSA's YouTube site, which is here on your slide, it shows that there's a recording available for the Archival Advocacy at Home webinar that was done last week. Uh, and that webinar goes into a lot of detail about how to plan a congressional visit, what to expect when you're there in a district, and then the messaging side that I'm broadly covering right now for you. The other thing is, even if you can't check out that whole website or the webinar, it's probably about 40 minutes, um, that advocacy guide and handouts available, if you follow that link, which uh, SAA has been kind enough to host our materials for us on their website, that link will bring you to all sorts of information. One of them that is really compelling, as far as I'm concerned, and we've shared this with the appropriations staff in Washington, D.C., is um, some graphs that show the number of organizations that applied for grants uh, from the NHPRC, the number of grants that applied for and the number of grants that were actually given out. And it's such a massive, disproportionate number it's probably almost four or five to one. Um, and the NHPRC has told us that they have more grants that they could fund that are great programs than they're able to fund currently. So if they even doubled the funding, it still isn't enough. Um, and you can see all that in, this, in these graphs that were provided and they're linked at that site. The other thing that's important on that site that would be helpful for all of you to see is a list of which congressmen and which U.S. senators are sitting on these key committees. Um, so North Carolina is a key state, Maryland, uh, Virginia, I'm not going to go through them all because there's a bunch of them, Ohio, and on and on and on. And so if one of your legislators is on that, uh, on one of those committees that's listed on that site, it'd be really helpful for you to make sure that there's efforts made to visit those people. So again, the, the markup is going to be happening in the next uh, four weeks or so, and so the more you can do to help us get through with that and make an impact, uh, the more likely it is that we'll actually get some funding here. Uh, Representative David Price from North Carolina is one of the uh, subcommittee chairs of a different subcommittee on appropriations in the House, and he's helping us behind the scenes to try and get our $10 million. But you know, if no one on those committees is hearing anything, and these congressmen don't see it as an, as an important issue, then we may end up in not a very good spot here. So that's my plea to all of you. Um, I think the next slide is questions. And so, Jamie, I think I'll turn it back over to you. And as questions come in, we can answer those if there are any questions from the audience. Thank you, Jim. We're, we're um, in well under the time. I'm going to take a look at the chat really quickly here. And I, I don't see any questions, you all please go ahead and type in your questions into the chat box and we'll take a look at those. I, just while we're waiting for that, I, I have a comment back from Dave's talk about the universal broadband and I just wanted to say I'm so glad to see that this is on a priority list. You know, it's, it's so important particularly to our smaller rural local, gov local government record keepers and archives and archivists and, and users of those records as well. And uh, it's something that, of course, I think libraries have, have been on in public library spectrum. So just a comment. I'm really, really glad to see that. Um, and I'm wondering Jenny, if one, oh, go ahead. I just, I see a comment here. If you can't make an actual physical visit, would a phone call or an email to some of these district offices help? And the answer is yes. Um, just express that, you know, you or your friend, whoever is making these calls, um, thinks that NHPRC is critical and that they deserve $10 million. And another thing that's available through that website um, that is linked here in the chat now by, I think Barbara put a link to it, <clears throat> is information state by state 
of what grants have been given. Like, for instance, if you go on there, you can pull up Indiana, and you'll see all the grants that NHPRC has given to Indiana. And that's the kind of information that would be helpful to explain to your congressional person or your senator um, that they it really does make an impact in your particular state or even better in the district of that congressperson. Um, but if you can't make a physical visit, a phone call or email would be helpful. Letters, regular letter letters through the post office, um, because they send everything through irradiation and check for biohazards and everything, it, it'll take probably at least six weeks, four to six weeks before they get it. So that won't be particularly helpful. I'm sorry for interrupting, Jamie. Oh, no, no interruption at all. That's great. It, it kind of goes into my um, one of my questions, or I guess very broad question. <laughs> um, you talked, I think David talked about developing advocacy and awareness messages um, to strengthen the state archives and, and this site, the SAA site, providing that type of detail information that makes it easy for people to get involved. And I guess just taking it a step further, I know that we have a couple of people at least in this webinar who are new to the profession. And so maybe just kind of finding their voice or developing their own kind of voice to speak out for the profession and, and for the field. So I wonder um, if you all can provide any insight or more details on how can we help those just getting started. I mean, it, it, it takes a little bit of empowerment, particularly when you're talking about contacting Congress, depending on your position within your own state organization. So maybe how people can get involved or um, develop their script to speak on behalf of or advocate for archives. That was a pretty long rambling question. I apologize. No, no. That's, Dave, were you going to say respond? Well, I was going to offer up, uh, you know, we could go to Jody first <laughs> in, in deference to her position, or you and I could tackle it whatever way you prefer. I'll be happy to start, and then go ahead and chime in, um, either one of you. So there, we have done a couple of different webinars now, um, and particularly the webinar we just gave last week explains exact all the steps if you're a newbie um, in how to do a district office visit. And uh, I think from a bigger perspective, if advocacy is something that you're interested in, um, COSA has its advocacy committee. And I know speaking I shouldn't speak for Dave, but I will. I think both of us would encourage anyone who's interested to get more involved with advocacy. Um, you know, it's probably not the place to get your feet wet, but it'd be a great place for um, you to be aware of what's going on and develop into an advocate. And uh, there's a lot of information sharing that occurs there. Dave, go well, ahead. and if, if you don't mind, Jim is being modest here because. Um, He's turned this thing into an art form, and he and Sarah Coons and, and Barbara have been particularly effective. And a, a lot of that has to come with, you know, you putting one foot in front of the other, putting your face in the door, and, you know, picking up the phone, um, you know, getting on the website, sending out the email, and you know, crafting your statement. It comes down to some of the simplest things that you, you want to do. If you have a position that you want, want to take, and your governing board, if you were answerable to one, uh, agrees with it, and then you, you can start as small as you want, or you can you can focus, you know, laser like on a particular target, and you can go for it. Uh, and if there's anything that that any of us, you you saw the list of people there, the the people on the advocacy committee. In fact, there are, there are a slew of us in in COSA who would be more than glad to assist if you had an, even an off the wall question. Most of us are. Some of us are more approachable than others, but I think I think everybody, starting with Barbara and the in the office, um, is a is a great place to go to say, okay, here I'm stuck. I want to do something. Uh, can you guide me? And whether you call up a webinar on demand or whether you you check, you know, any of the little sites that that can provide you a little bit of a prompt, uh, do not be bashful. Thank you. Thank you all. I'd like to, to oh, chime oh. in a little bit too, if I could. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, I think there's some great uh, resources, um, not only uh, in terms of COSA's uh, pieces, but um, you know the library associations, um, the uh, various humanities organizations, we're all kind of doing the same thing. So looking on YouTube, 
looking on the professional organizations for tips on advocacy. There's just great material out there. I'd also like to say that, um, as has already been mentioned, we have a really robust committee um, for advocacy, and uh, Kathleen Rowe has lots and lots of, of um, essays and pieces on YouTube um, that really lay out really practical things, as well as, of course, all the work that has been done um, by Jim and uh, the um, shared committee. Um, there's just a, a lot of different things that you can do looking at uh, sort of these allied organizations. So um, you got to just get in there and do it and build on whatever strengths that you have as an individual, whether that's, you know, you're great at speaking, you're great at writing. Not everyone has to approach it the same way either. Right. Great. Great advice. And I'd, I'd add to that to start local and think, think globally on that one. <laughs> Okay, any other questions? I don't see any other questions here um, from anyone, comments? So I will just move on, I guess, to uh, Lisa's going to a great way to, what a segue, great way to get involved is, are the annual meetings coming up for COSA. Uh, and Lisa's going to talk to us a little bit about what's coming up. Okay, thank you, Jamie. Uh, yeah, we have the annual COSA SAA annual meeting is in Austin, Texas this year. Um, and the schedule is a little different than in previous years. It's Friday through Monday, with the COSA portion being concentrated primarily to Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, so if you haven't made your plans to attend, now's the time. And I'm also going to throw out a plea um, those of you that are coming, do let us know. You just got sent a link to a Survey Monkey survey uh, on our, what are you planning to attend at the annual conference. That really helps us do the planning because uh, our wonderful sponsors, and we'll talk about them in a minute, um, actually help by supplying and paying for uh, a lot of the meals. And we don't want you to go away hungry. So we want to make sure that we have enough, but not too much uh, for these these sessions. So if you are planning on coming, do let us know um, what's coming up because uh, we, we think it's going to be a great event. Um, all right. In addition, we've got additional uh, webinars coming up. Uh, our theme this year is emergency preparedness and response. So May, we're going to have some case studies. Uh, Karen Gray and Susan Lugo uh, are going to talk about um, their experiences be with, with uh, what's happened in, in their states recently. And then in June, uh, we've got the Alliance for Response and the Fed Foundation for Advancement and Conservation are going to do the um, talk about the, what their work is and kind of how that kind of all fits in in the emergency preparedness. And then finally in July, we've got emergency preparedness with Lyricist and CCAHA. So uh, all of those are going to be excellent presentations, so I hope you will uh, register for those and we'll look forward to seeing you there. In addition, we of course have our upcoming Siri webinars. Uh, we've got IQ and U, uh, which is the May webinar, which is South Carolina's approach to governor's records. So that's going to be interesting to see how they're handling those. And then June will be bit by bit, which is the Alabama state electronic records project update. So if you want to learn more about what's going on with our Siri webinars, there's the link there on how to register, and you can see what other topics. I believe they, Siri is in the process of filling out the rest of the calendar year, so there'll be more great things to come from Siri as well. Also, we've got the several other upcoming events. Many of you next week are going to be hopefully at the Best Practices Exchange in Columbus, Ohio. And if you are, this year uh, COSA is going to be hosting an office hours. Uh, you may have just seen an a, a email about that. Please, if you're going to Best Practices, do, do make an effort to stop by for, open, for the uh, open office hours because we don't want Barbara to be lonely while she's there. So come by, say hello, and talk. Uh, in of July, of course, if before the uh, COSA annual conference, 
will be the Nagara Annual Conference, and this year it's in St. Paul, Minnesota. And then finally, of course, the COSA SAA meeting in Austin, Texas at the uh, end of July, early August. So if those aren't on your calendar already, you may want to put them on and click on the, and go to the websites and check on the programs and registration and all that other good stuff. Finally, well, not finally, but definitely one of the things that we couldn't do any of this without the support of our sponsors and funders, which of course include Ancestry, Family Search, Preservica, APPX, Gaylord Archival, Libnova, Space Saver, NHPRC, and IMLS. Um, again, they are such great partners and help us continue to put our message out there and continue to make sure that we've got the resources that we need to get the research and, and stuff out to you. As always, we want you to stay connected with us and find out some more information. So there are lots of ways that you can do that. We, of course, have the COSA website. And another great thing, particularly if you're kind of new to this field or new to COSA, is we have a wonderful resource center. And it's got lots and lots of resources on a lot of different topics. And it's being updated and added to. And it's a great place to go if you're looking for some of those pieces of information that can help make your case for something. We also have a Twitter handle. So those of you that are Twitter fans, uh, certainly follow us on Twitter, and we have a Facebook page and a YouTube channel. And our Facebook page is always posting lots of really great bits and pieces about what's happening in the archival world. And then our YouTube channel is really great if you missed any of our previous webinars. It's a great way for you to be able to go ahead and watch them and follow them and um, catch up. We love having you live. But if you can't be here, do go back and take a look at the recorded ones. And finally, and everybody ignores this, not everybody, but really the webinar evaluations are important to us. They do give us some information that helps, for, for example, the Education Committee as they plan future webinars. So we like to know a little bit about what you thought about the webinar. Was it useful? Are there things that you'd like to see different? Uh, are there topics that we haven't considered that you think, hey, that would make a really good webinar? Let us know. So please take time, please, to fill out the webinar evaluation. And uh, with that, um, I'd like to thank all of our participants today for a wonderful webinar, Jody, Dave, and Jim. And Jamie, thank you very much for being our moderator today. Uh, and thank you, all of our attendees, for uh, joining us for the April COSA member webinar. We hope it's been, been useful, and we hope to see you again at our future webinars. Uh, if anybody else has any other final comments, please offer them. If not, we thank you guys for joining us today. Thank you, everyone, and have a